advertising. You know, I thought about this a lot, and and you know, if you look up the classic definition, it, it talks about you know basically moral decisions. You know, ethics is about whether something is right or something is wrong. You know, are you making a right decision or are you making a wrong decision? And and on the surface, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, you know, this is clearly right, this is clearly wrong. But the thing is. It's, it's a little bit more entangled than that. As anybody in this room probably knows, you've been faced with certain ethically questionable decisions or ethical dilemmas, and what should you do? And of course, this happens daily for people in advertising. What should we do with this situation? And I remember my, my first experience as a kid with ethically questionable situations was with cereal. I was definitely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because I wanted, uh, it wasn't the Star Wars toy, it was actually a Transformers toy. I wanted it really, really badly. I saved up uh, all these uh, box tops or things like that, you know, the proofs of purchase. And the thing is, on the front of the box, it made the Transformers toy, which wasn't even in the normal Transformers lineup. Um, it was like some special edition junk piece of toy. But it made it look like it was going to fly. And I was convinced. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to have the Transformer that flies. So I saved up. And, and I was extremely disappointed when it finally arrived. The, the paint was chipping off the front, and I was like, that's just wrong. Now maybe, maybe in my six-year-old brain I, I didn't quite talk like that, but I was definitely disappointed. Um, but cereal continues to do this, you know? There's the free car inside, and you might even say that, is it ethically questionable to be putting this kind of stuff on cereal boxes in the first place, right? Because this kind of creates that, that uh, what do they call it, the pant leg nag factor, you know, for parents, where they kind of believe, I want this cereal, I want this cereal. And, um, and so, you know, it continues to this day. And, and it's interesting, if you look closely at that, you'll see next to the, what is he, what kind of bird is he? Is he a toucan? No, that's Fruit Loops. He's some sort of bird, um, but it says the ultimate chocolatey experience. And so there's this really interesting thing that happens in advertising and marketing, and it has to do with language, and it's very uh, ethically questionable. I know last, last uh, Creative Mornings was about language, so there's this kind of interesting continuity there. And when you look at cereal over the years, all of the language in cereal boxes, all of the language in advertising is very questionable. It's fascinating because back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, cereals look like this. You guys notice the big difference here? All these are sugar smacks, sugar frosted flakes, and sugar pops. And parents started noticing that their kids were bouncing off the walls. And they were like, what is it? Maybe it's the sugar. <laughs> so then the, the cereal companies said, well, what could we do here? Parents are kind of backlashing a little bit against this. What should we do? Should we change the formula of the product? Nah. Let's just change what we call it. So it's honey smacks, or we got rid of the sugar part on the frosted flakes, just frosted flakes, or my favorite, corn pops. So it's not sugar corn pops anymore, it's just, it's just corn, and they're lightly sweetened, crunchy sweetened, and all of them have that toy. They're all offering that toy. In fact, that Starbot, that's not Transformers, I don't think, but it looks like it flies. You guys see that? You guys see that image? That toy is gonna fly, and in a six-year-old brain, you think it's gonna happen. So. But the thing is, what's funny about advertising and packaging, especially around food, is, is how they use language to kind of make you kind of come in a little bit closer. So again, we saw with, um, with Cocoa, Cocoa Puffs, uh, you know, that it was chocolatey flavor. Here you've got chocolatey chip muffins. Now I'm gonna tell you guys a little insider secret. If it says chocolatey, chances are it's not made with chocolate. <laughs> that little Y on the back end of that word changes everything. Is it ethically questionable? Maybe. I don't know. What do you guys think? Is it ethically questionable? Raise your hands if you think that's ethically questionable. OK? Raise your hands if you're like, that's all right. You got to do what you got to do. OK? So you know, the flavor is baked inside, thank goodness. And who doesn't want a nice hot cup of rich milk chocolate flavor? You know, don't get me wrong, I like a good cup of Nestle something, but, but you know, it, and it says it's made with real Nestle cocoa, but they, you'll notice the discrepancy there. They've got the flavor word on there. So anytime you see something with the word flavor, let your little spidey senses go up and be like, oh, this might not be what I'm thinking it is. This is one of my favorites, Hershey's Genuine Chocolate Flavor. So you've got that word genuine at the top, you've got flavor somewhere in there, 
Uh, and, you know, and then of course they've got all the calories and everything and it's fat free, but, but you know, hierarchy is an important thing when it comes to advertising, the information that you put out there. And, and lately, you know, Hershey's is seeing like people want more from their products. Same thing with cereal, you see like vitamin D, vitamin A, which cracks me up. Like I'm not getting Cocoa Krispies or Cocoa Puffs for my vitamin D source, <laughs> you know. But, but Hershey's is seeing that. They see that trend in the marketplace. Consumers say in this survey or that focus group, they want more XYZ. So let's give them what they want. It's Hershey's syrup with calcium. <laughs> and it includes five essential vitamins and minerals. And again, it's genuine chocolate flavor. But the thing is, if you flip that bottle around and you look more carefully at it, you'll notice there's 0% calcium in there. Okay, so again, you know, when, when you work in this business, it's tough, you know, there's a cognitive dissonance that comes again and again when you're, you're designing the front of that package and you're like, all right, well, it's got calcium, let's, let's work with that. And then they give you the nutritionals and you're looking at it, you're like, it doesn't have any calcium. I'm not sure if I can keep working on this account. Um, so, you know, you, you've just got to always, like, take that into account. And so when you're looking at things, you know, as, as, as someone in this business, in the creative business, you get asked to do a lot of things, and it's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough line. I found this the other day. My, my daughter, we were, we were getting some food, and she saw Yoo-Hoo. And, and again, I always thought it was chocolate milk. It's just a chocolate drink. The first ingredient is water, and then it's high fructose corn syrup, and then there's whey from milk. And it contains, again, 2% of cocoa. So like all these years, I've been drinking Yoo-Hoo, and I thought it was chocolate milk, but it really wasn't. So again, it's difficult. Uh, and I know you guys are thinking like, gosh, this guy's got a real chocolate fixation. <laughs> He's just so focused on chocolate. <laughs> I am. But this goes, this goes to this whole thing about you know, hierarchy. And this is one of the biggest ethical issues that, that we as creatives in this business have to face which is how do you create the hierarchy for something when you know that things are maybe a little different on the back side of the label, right, with nutritionals and things like that. So, so again, chocolate flavor, and then in even the biggest thing on this, it's not the logo, the bunny's a little bit bigger, but no sugar added. Well, what's in it then? How are they making it so sweet? How are they making my children love it so much if there's no sugar added? I'm not going to go to the back of the label on this, but again, the point here is that you've got that ethical issue because how big should something be? And sometimes people will, will be taken to court, uh, you know, legally if, if you make something too big. So, for example, um, one of our clients, Benito's, is, is, you know, looking at other chips that are saying, like, they're made from beans, but they're corn chips. They're made from corn, but they say Black beans, really big. So is that ethically you know, disingenuous? It's a good question. This is a personal experience I had, um, and, and there's this huge gap a lot of times between marketing and reality. I actually bought this because I guess I do have a chocolate problem, and <laughs> I got it. I was like, oh, it's Easter. This bunny's cute. Let's get this. This is what it looked like inside. <laughs> I mean, that is like the most golem-looking rabbit <laughs> I've ever seen. But you can imagine the dilemma with melting chocolate and then reforming. Maybe that's what it is. It's just melted and reformed. I don't know if they come out of the factory like this. Or maybe they're handmade to look like that. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the nightmare scenario for a child is opening that up and seeing that. And, but, but, you know, you sell a lot more with the picture on the left than you do. Or your left? Yeah, your left. Um, than you do with the actual chocolate. So there's that, that big gap between marketing and reality. And what's interesting is, is you're seeing now with things like you know, Yelp and a lot of digital tools are allowing regular people to say, this is what the food looks like at the restaurant. Because again, with, with marketing, we're all about, hey, look over there. It's really, marketing is all about misdirection. You know, it's like magic or illusion, if, if you like the idea of illusion. So it's look over there. And, and it's all about that hierarchy, right? So how you stagger the words, you know, you could read it as naked waitresses flirt with you, or the, tr the naked truth about our waitresses is they only flirt with you to get better tips. So again, how we deal with that is something that we all have to, you know, grapple with in this industry. Because here's the reality, and I love this, approximately three minutes, the picture on the right, it, it takes three minutes to be assembled by our dedicated crew, but it takes about four hours 
to make it look the way it does in the picture, and that's the art of artifice. And so what do you do when you're in this business? I promise, I keep asking, what do you do, what do you do? I'm gonna get to some ideas for what you can do to cope with the cognitive dissonance of these ethically questionable decisions. But how many people have been faced with this type of situation? Of, of having to, to create something look more beautiful in, in art than, than it is in real life? Can I see a raise of hands for all the creative folks here? Okay, and it's challenging, right? You're kinda like, this isn't what those, those that, what is that, a quarter pounder? I don't even know, it's not a Big Mac. You know, what do you do with that? And the, the challenge in this business, too, is that at the end of the day, it goes from what, what do we want to say, right? The business owners, the, the clients will say, well, these are the things we want to say, you know, to customers to get them to pay attention to us. But it becomes this slippery slope to what can we say? What can we just get away with potentially? And so this was a situation, cheat death? If you drink pomegranate juice, palm wonderful, and the court said, nah, you can't say that. <laughs> That's pushing it just a little too far in terms of hyperbole. And there was a lawsuit put against them. And so they had to take that down. They, 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 they lost a little bit of money on that. So sometimes, you know, the, the legal system will actually pull you back if you go too far ethically. Um, you, you end up in this place of truthiness a lot of times in this business. And I don't know exactly Stephen Colbert's definition, this was found on the internet, but it's the quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if it's not necessarily true. And, and we see those types of claims all the time. Here was a campaign from uh, Chevron, the world needs more than oil. That's true. Is Chevron gonna give it to us? I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of research that shows that they, they spent more on the media buy of the campaign than they, than they do on alternative forms of energy, right? So this is a, an amazing campaign to make people be like, yeah, Chevron, I'm gonna buy my gas from there because they understand that it's time oil companies get behind the development of renewable energy, 1% of their budgets. You know, that's the part that they don't focus on because it's a little bit of misdirection, it's a little bit of hierarchy, and it changes everything. I love the one on the far right, protecting the planet is everyone's job. Yes, it is. I agree with that. Does that change whether you're going to buy at Chevron? Who knows? But, but that's how they, they work the hierarchy. This is a great one. Here's a, here's a tip. I mentioned chocolatey chips. Anything that is spelled weird <laughs> in food, in, in technology and apps, you know, you've got Flickr with no vowels or, or no E there. You know, Dropbox has maintained its vowels, which is great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of tech companies, they just drop the vowels. But when you see something like this, just you know, ask yourself, is it really chicken meat? <laughs> and you'll see the asterisk you know, right next to wings. Um, it says, with no wing meat. So uh, there might be chicken in there, but it's not going to be wing meat specifically. I can't testify to what kind of meat it is, but, but you know, so something to think about. Um, you know, another ethically questionable situation, uh, you guys notice how much protein is in these cereals? Again, going back to cereal, it's like, you know, again, businesses, they look and they say, this is the research. People want more from their snacks, their cereals, from all these things. But I love this. It's 10 grams of protein, or it's 11 grams of protein with milk. <laughs> how much protein is in the actual cereal? It might be four grams, it might be five grams, but usually it's the milk doing all the heavy lifting. The milk is doing all the work. It, it isn't just with food, it's also with, you know, the, the green movement, sustainability, uh, eco-friendly products. You know, you guys have probably seen things like this. The new eco-shaped bottle. It's got 30% less plastic, so the bottle actually just melts in your hand, <laughs> basically. But does that make it green? I mean, like bottled water, Right? There's this big controversy around bottled water. Is, is bottled water inherently not green? You know, when tap water, you can get it from, from you know, most everywhere. Whether it's the Dasani, 30% uh, made from plants, or, you know, the one that everybody loves to, to, to hate, I guess, is Fiji. You know, because it's got that really thick plastic, and even though it's untouched by man, it's still carted around the world, and it's a bottle of water. So is there any such thing as a green bottle of water? You know? That raises the question. But again, companies see this and they say, man, we're getting all this backlash. People are hating on our bottled water. We've got to do something. Let's make it from plants. 
Let's make it 30% less plastic. Let's do something to get people to not dislike it so much. And you can't blame them. But it's not just for-profit companies that have this challenge. There are non-profit companies as well. Is it ethically questionable for Susan G. Komen to make a partnership with KFC? You know, I got nothing against KFC. I like me some, you know, grilled chicken and some fried chicken, but it's one of those things where it's like in the effort to get more attention and more exposure, does a nonprofit have an ethical obligation to be like, there are just some brands we're not going to partner with, you know, and KFC might be one of them. Or Milano Cookies, or my favorite, Mike's Hard Pink Lemonade. <laughs> Drink for the cure. Okay. <laughs> So, so, you know, nonprofits have as much of a challenge as for-profit companies. Uh, I was working on a, on a hunger campaign uh, years ago, and, and the, the task was to help end hunger. And I remember, you know, hearing that assignment, and, I, and I, you know, not to be facetious or anything, but I was just like, you, you can't end hunger permanently. You know, like, you can end hunger for a little while with a snack, with a meal, with a food, but you're always going to end up being hungry again. So there's no way to end hunger, but the, the tagline or the line of like, you know, uh, temporarily, uh, you know, dissipate your hunger isn't, doesn't sell as much, right? And so in this particular case, it was a nonprofit. We were working on this hunger campaign, and they weren't getting as many donations or pledges as they wanted to. So the numbers weren't looking that good in terms of we spent all this money on a campaign, but we weren't getting the money back. So what did we do? Ethically questionable, I ask you. We, we translated it to how many meals we were getting people, because one dollar equals seven meals. That number is bigger, and that plays better. And it's hard, you know, because I'm in and I'm kind of like, I want to help end hunger. I want to, you know, help people with food insecurity, but the money's not coming in, so we can change the numbers. So numbers can lie, you know, numbers can be manipulated. I was also working on some campaigns years ago uh, with, with regard to autism and, and some other nonprofits. And, and with autism, you know, the CDC had done a study and found that one in 150 children will be diagnosed with autism. Now, this was back in 2007. That was an astonishing number, you know, and we used that in the campaign. But I was working on another nonprofit, and they're like, we need numbers like that to get people to care about our nonprofit cause. And so uh, it was for spinal cord injuries. Um, and so we went and we, we fielded a survey. And, and we found out that one in 50 Americans lives with paralysis. Now, you look at that number and you're like, no way. That's crazy, right? But the goal was to create this you know, six degrees of separation. Like, chances are you know somebody who's lived with, what's in red box, some form of paralysis. Now, how was paralysis defined in the survey, in the questions? Have you ever had a tingling sensation in your hand or your foot for more than five minutes? That's a form of paralysis. Is it? So nonprofits have to deal with some of these same issues. And so, because everybody's trying to get more money, more pledges, more attention, and it is a challenge. It's, it's an ethically uh, you know, challenging situation. Another uh, brand I was working on or got invited to work on for new business was this P&G Future Friendly. Now, do you guys see any green products up here? Are there any products that you're like, yep, they're advancing sustainability like I've never seen, you know? Well, so I get invited to the new business pitch because I'm the green guy. I'm Mr. Sustainability at the agency. And they're like, well, Chris, you know more about this than any of us here. And so, you know, help us with, with these ideas. And I, I literally asked, do I have any option here? <laughs> Do I have any option to just back out? Because I was like, what about any of these products is green? And they were like, well, the bounty paper towels and some of the toilet paper, uh, they're double rolls. So they're econo-sized rolls, so that means fewer of those cardboard cores <laughs> going into landfills. And I was like, that's, that's not sustainability, because it's not even made from recycled material. It's just you're making more of it. So is Costco a green company? Like, is Costco, because you can buy econo-sized everything at Costco, does that make them inherently green? Probably not, but, but that was the issue. So again, I was like, well, can I, is there anything I can do about this? And they said, nope, you're working on this. So I just kept working on it. And you guys are probably like, oh, that's so sad. <laughs> Chris, your, your ethics are just questionable. So, so here's the thing. So I've said, you know, what can you do? What can you do? So what can we do in these situations? Here's the big punchline, okay? In these situations that we all face in the creative industry when we're faced with these types of dilemmas, there are, in my, in my experience, three things that you can do. The first is alcohol. 
okay? There's a reason why those mad men back in the 1960s were drinking the three martini lunch, okay? They probably had all sorts of ethically questionable situations and things they had to say. And so that's your first line of defense, okay? Just numb the pain. <laughs> Ease the cognitive dissonance, okay? The second to make yourself kind of like, you know, rev up that, that heart engine of yours and just be like, okay, I, I, I've learned all this stuff about, you know, the, the bottled water situation. You know, I'm working on this account. I know what's going on. I want to use my talents for some kind of cause. You know, I want to take this information that I've learned and, and, and take my talents and find somebody or, or a client like Tapped New York, you know, and, and create something that will make a difference in the world. And then the third, option is kind of a three-part piece, which is changing from within, okay? Change, not, not just changing yourself, but also changing the company from within. And so the first thing, and I know it maybe sounds counterintuitive, is, is be compassionate. So when I was, you know, working for different agencies, like I said, I'd have these situations, future-friendly, nonprofits, end hunger campaigns, and, and I would just be like, oh my God, you know, this is ridiculous. And I would, I, my Che Guevara side would sort of come out and I'd be like, I don't want to do this. But the thing is, you've got to understand, it's, there's this chain of command, and everybody's got a boss that they're serving. Everybody's got either shareholders or a board. And so having you know, that level of compassion that makes you understand, look, everybody's just trying to do the best that they can. So learn as much as you can and, and, and do the best that you can within those circumstances. Because the reality is, a lot of people face these issues. Your bosses, my bosses, they, they're dealing with them. And so just try to understand that. And, and, don't just stick it to the man, be like, I'm out of here. You know, don't, don't do that. Just try to do the best you can. The, the next thing is, in, in that same vein, is do your best work. You know, your best work might not be as great as you want it to be, ethically speaking. You know, you might say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to do anything for P&G's Future Friendly. But P&G's Future Friendly is trying to move the needle. I mean, businesses at the end of the day, they are the engines that, that get people's attention, right? Through, through advertising, through marketing. And so do your best work, play nice with others, and, and, and down the road, you know, that will pay off. And then finally, keep your chin up. You know, I know it's hard, and, and a lot of times in this business, we, we get knocked down a lot, and, and we feel this cognitive dissonance, which is why we turn to the alcohol. But, but if you just keep going, keep your chin up, uh, I promise everything's gonna be okay. So, uh, you know, this was the quote that inspired me to start Gallant. Um, and it was by Bill Bernbach, who is an ad man through and through. And he said, all of us who professionally use the mass media are shapers of society. We can vulgarize that society, we can brutalize it, or we can help lift it onto a higher level. That's my encouragement to you guys is continue, you know, fight the good fight, keep doing what you're doing, and help lift society up onto a higher level. Thank you.